In this video, we're going to take a look at finding pH of polyprotic weak acid solutions. You remember that the term polyprotic means that the acid has more than one hydrogen ion to donate. There might be a diprotic acid, for example, carbonic acid down below has two hydrogens in its formula, so it's diprotic. It could be a triprotic acid, like phosphoric acid, which has three hydrogens in its formula. These are all polyprotic acids in the table. If, it has, if it's a diprotic acid, it'll have two Ka values, one for each step of its ionization. If it's triprotic, it'll have three Ka values, again, one for each step of the ionization. Now, in this table, you'll also see sulfuric acid, but sulfuric acid is not a weak acid. The first step of its ionization has a large Ka value, and the second step has a weak dissociation, a weak ionization. So calculating pH for sulfuric acid is a little bit different than what we're going to do here, and I've addressed that in a separate video on my YouTube channel. So if you're looking at sulfuric acid, take a look at the other video. So here we're only going to look at the polyprotic weak acids, the acids where the first Ka value is small. An example, let's calculate the pH of 0 0.020 molar phosphoric acid, H3PO4. Okay, the first step is very similar to what we would do in any other weak acid question. So if you know what you're doing, pause the video and try to set the first step up. So we take the acid, H3PO4, and we're going to react it with the water that it's dissolved in. So it reacts with water. Bronsted and Lowry tell us that the acid donates the hydrogen ion to water, so the water will accept that and become H3O positive, the hydronium ion. And then after losing a hydrogen ion, the phosphoric acid becomes dihydrogen phosphate. Whoops, one minus would be its charge. Having lost a positive. Now we're going to set up an ice table. The initial concentration of the acid is 0 0.020 molar. Water is a liquid, so in our ice table, we're going to ignore the water. So we'll just put a big X under there. It's dissolved in water, and we'll assume 25 degrees Celsius. In water at 25 degrees, there is some initial hydronium. The water self-ionizes and produces 1 times 10 to the minus 7 molarity hydronium just by itself. That's why the pH of water is 7 at 25 degrees. But that initial hydronium, 1 times 10 to the minus 7, is such a small number that we're going to basically ignore it and say that the hydronium starts at 0. There is no dihydrogen phosphate initially in the water. Now let's go to the side of our table and describe phosphoric acid. We know that it's a weak acid. We know that it's triprotic. That's three hydrogens to donate. The first ionization constant is 7.5 times 10 to the minus 3. Now I'm using numbers here from this table you should use numbers from the ionization table that you have. So if you've got a data booklet, use the numbers that are in your data booklet or whatever other reference source you might have. Okay? The Ka values are measured values, so they slightly differ when you look from one table to another. But they should be very similar. So for this, the first step of the ionization, the Ka value was 7.5 times 10 to the minus 3. Now, as far as weak acids go, that's actually a, a, one of the larger Ka values. So phosphoric acid, even though it's a weak acid, it should ionize to a reasonable amount. But it's not going to completely ionize. So we'll say that it loses x. These will gain x because it's all a one-to-one -one ratio in the balanced equation. At equilibrium, we have this much unionized phosphoric acid, 
we have some hydronium, and we have some dihydrogen phosphate. The Ka value for step one will equal the hydronium concentration. We're just writing the equilibrium expression times the dihydrogen phosphate concentration over the phosphoric acid concentration. And of course, that's 7.5 times 10 to the minus 3. And if we put our algebra in, that'll equal x squared over 0 0.020 minus x. Now, if you own a graphing calculator and you want to use your solver feature on the calculator to solve this equation, go for it. I'm going to use the method of successive approximations. I'm going to say here that since the Ka1 is small, we expect that x is going to be very small. So we'll assume that x is much less than the 0 0.020 that's there in the denominator. If I make that assumption that it's much less than 0 0.02, then we can now say 7.5 times 10 to the minus 3 is approximately equal to x squared. Instead of 0 0.02 minus x, we can just say over 0 0.020. That x in the denominator we're assuming is much less than 0 0.02, as a result, when you subtract it from 0 0.02, the answer should be very close to 0 0.02, so this is what we have. This equation is very simple to solve. If you haven't already done it, grab a calculator and solve it. 7.5 times 10 to the minus 3 multiplied by 0 0.02, the denominator, equals, and now this is equal to x squared, so I'm going to square root this answer, and my first approximation for the answer is x is 0 0.012. I'm going to keep just two significant digits. Now I'm going to get a second approximation, which should be better than the first. That's why this is called successive approximations. I'm going to take my first value for x that I've got, my first approximation, and I'm going to put it back into the Ka expression up above on the denominator because that's where we ignored the x originally. So I'm going to grab my calculator, I'm going to put 0 0.012 in the denominator where it says 0 0.02 minus x, it'll say 0 0.02 minus 0 0.012. And then I'm going to resolve for the x in the numerator. So I'll, I'll do the denominator first, 0 0.02 minus 0 0.012 equals and now I'm going to multiply this by the Ka value out front, equals, and now this is x squared, so I'll square root the answer again. And my second approximation is actually different from the first by a reasonable amount. It's 0 0.0077. All right, so the first approximation was too, too big, it's bigger than the true value. The second val one, which is now lower, this one's too small. Okay, so we started too big, this one's too small. Let's get a third approximation. This third approximation will do exactly what we did a moment ago. We're going to take the 0 0.0077 and put it back in the denominator of the original expression and solve again for the x in the numerator. So on the calculator, 0 0.02 minus 0 0.0077 equals times this by the Ka value, 7.5 times 10 to the minus 3 equals, and then square root the answer. And this one's increased, so now we're up to 0 0.0096 molarity. So the first one was too big, the second one is too small, the third one is too big again. The successive approximations approach, your answers bounce around the true value, but they get closer and closer. So let's do a fourth one. We're going to continue this until we get the answer staying constant. So take the 0 0.0096, our third approximation, put it back in the denominator. 0 0.02 minus 0 0.0096 equals multiply by the Ka value and square root the answer. 
we're getting towards the right answer, 0 0.0088. Normally, you don't need to do this many approximations. So let's do a fourth one, sorry, a fifth one. So 0 0.02 minus 0 0.0088 equals times by the Ka value equals and square root the answer. We're getting close because the answers are getting close together, 0 0.0092. Okay, we're getting closer and closer together. I'm going to continue until I get the answers staying the constant. So one more time, hopefully, maybe two more times. 0 0.02 minus 0 0.0092 equals times by the Ka and square root the answer. And I think maybe just one more time. A seventh approximation. 0 0.02 minus this guy times the Ka and square root the answer. Yes, and we're done. So my rule of thumb is to stop when the last digit changes by just one or it doesn't change at all. So 0 0.0091 is our final answer with this method of approximations. Um, it's the answer you should have got if you used the graphing calculator's solver feature. Okay? The reason we use that method, the successive approximations method, is because otherwise solving that equation would have meant solving a quadratic equation, which is beyond the ability of many high school students. So what we want to do now is take a look at the second step. Well, let's look back up at the Ka values. Notice that the for phosphoric acid, let me erase these other things. For phosphoric acid, the first step was weak and its Ka was around 10 to the minus three. The second step is much weaker. Its Ka value is 10 to the minus eight. The third step is much weaker again. Its Ka value is 10 to the minus 13. So because the second and third steps are so much weaker than the first step, we're going to make an assumption. We're going to assume that the first step produced a significant amount of hydronium. We know that the hydronium, the x value, is 0 0.0091 molarity. If we go ahead and do a second step and do a third step, we will get some more hydronium, but it's going to be so much smaller than this value that when we combine it all together and get the total hydronium, those second and third steps really won't matter. In other words, if we calculate the hydronium from step two, which we could, or calculate from step three, which we could, and then we add it all up, the hydronium from step one plus step two plus step three, we'll find that the hydronium at the end is just 0 0.0091 because steps two and three are so much weaker than step one, they don't really contribute any significant hydronium to the solution. All right, I hope you understand that. So, but I wanna, I wanna say that in my answer. So since Ka2 and Ka3 are so much smaller, I'll put a double less than sign, the Ka for step one, we can ignore steps two and three, all right? So you have to say something like that to tell me that you recognize that phosphoric acid does have three steps in its ionization, but that we are only going to focus on the first step because the second and third steps are so much weaker. Does this work generally? Is this generally a good thing you can do with, with polyprotic acids? Well, almost always, if you look at these list of acids, almost always, when there's more than one step, the Ka of the second step or the Ka of the th third step, they are almost always much weaker than the Ka in the first step. There might be a couple places where that's not legitimate. For example, tartaric acid at the end, 10 to the minus five, 
is not, whoops, 10 to the minus 5 is not really that much smaller than 10 to the minus 3. So for tartaric acid, this might not work. It might not also work for citric acid, right? But there's a lot more uh, polyprotic acids than you see here. And it's almost always the case that the second step will be much weaker than the first. In our course, that's the only kind of polyprotic acid we'll see other than sulfuric acid. So having made this assumption, we can now say, therefore, the hydronium concentration is the X value that we have from above, 0 0.0091 molarity, and the pH is just the negative log of that. So when you step back and look at this, you realize that this scary looking polyprotic acid with three steps to it, turns out that we treat it as though it was just a monoprotic acid. We treat it as though it has only one step that's important, okay? But you have to include a statement like this after you finished the first step, which tells me that you recognized there were more than one step, but you're explaining why we're ignoring it why we're ignoring those other two steps. All right, so there is a phosphoric acid calculation. Now, maybe you also are asked to find the percent ionization. Okay, this is just a little review. Percent ionization, we know that the phosphoric acid was weak and it does not, does not ionize 100%. Well, then what percent did ionize? To figure that out, we look back at our ice table, look at the phosphoric acid in the ice table. It began with a, whoops, it began with a concentration. <laughs> Let me get the right tool here. It began with a concentration of 0 0.02, and the amount that ionized was X. It lost X. So to figure out the percent ionization, we're just going to take the X value, the amount that ionized, and divide by that starting amount, and then times by 100. So for us, we'll get 0 0.0091, the amount of phosphoric acid that ionized, divided by the starting amount, the 0 0.02 molar, and we'll times by 100. So 0 0.0091 over 0 0.02 times 100, so this was actually 45.5, or I guess 46, if we put significant digits there, 46% ionized. If you've done other weak acid problems, that's a pretty high percent ionization, right? They're usually less than 10% ionized. Phosphoric acid had a pretty big Ka1. It was 10 to the minus 3. It was also reasonably dilute, 0 0.02 molar. Those two things combined meant that this was going to ionize to a large degree, larger than usual. That's why we ended up having to go through seven approximations, because it was actually ionizing a reasonably large amount. Okay, so 46%, almost half of it, ionized. All right? So there you have it, a phosphoric acid example. If you're doing homework questions for me in the regular grade 12 chemistry, this is how you would approach questions, let's see, questions 36 through question 38. Okay, so 36, 37, 38 in your acid-base homework questions are done in this way. Okay, we just did phosphoric acid. Hope that helps.